Tonight I want to speak to you on the subject of the super sign of Bible prophecy. And I want to be humble enough to say that I didn't coin that phrase. I heard it at some point in my ministry. I don't remember directly who coined that phrase, but in 40 plus years of studying Bible prophecy and end time events and eschatology, by the way, if you're a new Christian, eschatology is just a theological word that means the study of end times. I remember several authors through the years referring to this specific prophecy, one single prophecy, as the super sign of all Bible prophecy or the most significant prophecy in the Bible. Let me take you into the Old Testament minor prophet. His name was Amos. Amos chapter 9, beginning to read at verse 11, reading through verse 15. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. In that day, I will restore the fallen house of David. I will repair its damaged walls. From the ruins, I will rebuild it and restore its former glory. And Israel will possess what is left of Edom and all the nations I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken, and he will do these things. Highlight that. When it comes to Bible prophecy, he will do these things. Verse 13, the time will come, says the Lord, when the grain and grapes will grow faster than they can be harvested. Then the terraced vineyards on the hills of Israel will drip with sweet wine. I will bring my exiled people of Israel back from distant lands, and they will rebuild their ruined cities and live in them again. They will plant vineyards and gardens, and they will eat their crops and drink their wine. I will firmly plant them there in their own land. They will never again be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we once again open up the sacred scriptures, I humble my heart in your holy presence and before these precious people whom you love, whom your only son Jesus Christ died for, rose again, ascended to the Father with the promise that he'll return. And Jesus told us that we should live ready every day for we do not know the day nor the hour of that promised appointment. My prayer is that every person within the sound of my voice would live every day ready to meet the Lord. My prayer is that if there are those listening, those present in the sanctuary, the audience that is listening online, and those that might listen to this on various platforms in the days and weeks and months ahead, I pray that every single one of them would turn from sin and turn to Christ while there is yet time. I ask you to do what no preacher can do, what no evangelist can do, what no sermon can do. I ask you by the power of the Holy Spirit to speak to hearts and lives in a way where prison doors swing open and no bondage of sin can last or hold. Set captives free and give them that holy tug and let them know tonight's the night. When the invitation is given in the moments to come, give them the faith and courage to do what they ought to do. Let today be their hour of decision. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. As we go into Bible prophecy tonight, let me lay everything upon what I believe is one of the most important questions you will ever hear in your life. Because, listen carefully, Bible prophecy was not given to us by God to fill our minds and our intellect with biblical prophetic trivia. The purpose of Bible prophecy is not just for you to have knowledge and understanding, but to keep a fire of holiness burning in your heart, knowing 
that there's a reason why you serve the Lord. Nobody backslides until they lose sight that I need to live ready to meet the Lord. If you think the Lord could come tonight while you're sleeping, it motivates you to say a prayer before you close your eyes, as I often do. Father, if there's anything that I have done today that grieves your heart, that was wrong, known or unknown, wash me fresh in the blood of Jesus, keep me ready every day of my life. So with that said, I want you to listen very carefully to what I believe is one of the most important questions, if not the most important question you'll ever hear in your life. Here it is. Do you have a clear, distinct memory of a time in your life when you have knelt in the presence of a holy God and personally and publicly repented of your sin and ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. I'm not asking you if you think so. I'm not asking you if you hope so. I'm asking you, do you know so? Do you have a clear, distinct memory of a time in your life when you've gotten down on bended knees in the presence of a holy God and admitted your sin and repented and asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Because when I give the invitation in the moments to come, that's what we're going to do. I'm not asking you tonight to become a Protestant. I'm not asking you tonight to become a Catholic. I'm not asking you tonight to become religious. I'm asking you tonight to make peace with God before it's too late. And some of you are trying to have peace with God by being a better version of yourself, and that doesn't work. The gospel is not a self-help gospel. It's a crucify you gospel. John 3.30 says, He must increase and I must decrease. You're not right with God because you try to be more moral or decent or involved in humanitarian projects or help the poor or whatever. We're not saved by anything we do. We can only be saved by the acknowledgement of our own sin and by faith in Christ alone and by His great grace. With that said, there's three things about Israel that every Christian needs to know. And that's all I'm going to do tonight. In just a few moments, I'm going to reveal to you and make clear from Scripture what the most important prophecy is in the Bible or the super sign of Bible prophecy is. But the entire Bible, and this is what, listen, this is what separates the Bible from all religious books, all sacred writings, all other religions. Christians are oftentimes accused in debate forums and television and documentaries and liberal discussions, well, Evangelicals are guilty of claiming exclusivity, that their religion is the only religion, and that's why people get so angry with the evangelical community, is they refuse to budge on the issues of exclusivity. Well, let me tell you something. That's an unfair accusation for a few reasons. Number one, Every major religion in the world claims exclusivity. Every major religion in the world claims exclusivity. But more importantly, and put on your thinking cap for this, truth by nature is exclusive. Two plus two equals four making four exclusively the only answer. So truth by nature is exclusive. And Jesus made no apology for that. In John 14 and verse 6, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. Unapologetically. I declare to you, there is only one way to right relationship with God, and it is through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ 
and his shed blood. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But Christianity is the only one that can build that upon apologetics. People say, I don't think any preacher should apologize for God. That's not what the word apologetics means. You'd be surprised how many times people, well, you need to quit apologizing for God. Apologetics means evidences, undeniable proofs. And the Bible can be proved through apologetics. Let me give you five very quickly. And when you get a chance, go to our YouTube channel. Subscribe. It's free. Or if you like the podcast thing, do the podcast thing. It's free. But mark this down. I'm not going to take the time to deal with it tonight. But listen to a teaching entitled, Five Reasons Why You Can Believe the Bible. The Bible is provable through science. Now, many people think that science and the Bible are at odds. And it is true that many scientists are at odds with the Bible, Christianity, and such matters. But the Bible has proven science before science has proven the Bible. For example, the Bible prophesied that the earth was round centuries before people were believing it was a flat earth. And there's still people who hold on to a flat earth science. And uh, if you hold on to a flat earth science, keep listening to my YouTube channel. <laughs> Plus, if you believe in flat earth science, then you disagree with the Bible. It's impossible to be a Christian and say you believe in a flat earth because the Bible said it's a sphere. And from the Hebrew, it means round like a ball. Long before science, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before science ever proved that. And I could go on, but it's provable through science. It's provable through biblical archaeology. Over 24,000 digs in the land of the Bible. And again, people get confused. I've had people say, well, of course, biblical archaeology proves the Bible. It's biblical archaeology as if it were a Christian science. Biblical archaeology is not a Christian science. It's a secular science. And it's leading voices, authors, and those that have been prolific are mostly agnostics and atheists. It is simply called biblical archaeology because it's archaeology done in the land of the Bible. And there have been over 24,000 digs, none of which have ever disproven the Bible, thousands of which have proven the authenticity and the historicity of the Bible. It's provable through science. It's provable through biblical archaeology. It's provable through manuscript evidence. You take all of the literary greats, Aristotle, Iliad, Homer, on down the line. If you go to college and you major in literary arts, all of them together have less than 1,800 manuscripts. But the Bible now has over 66,000. They keep discovering them. In the days of the King James Bible, they had less than five manuscripts for the New Testament, none of which were totally complete. Today, we have over 66,000 manuscripts, scrolls, bits, pieces. And the Bible can be proven. People say, well, you know, the Bible's been translated in so many languages, even if it were true. It's been translated so many times, you can't believe it. They fail to understand that proper translation, and that's why I always teach be sure you have an accurate translation of the Bible. Not all translations are accurate. Listen to our study on which translation of the Bible is the most accurate. If you want to get into the science of how Bibles are interpreted and manuscripts are interpreted. But don't miss this. When you have the original, it doesn't matter how many times it's been copied or translated into languages when everybody's going back to the original. So that's an invalid argument. The Bible is provable through manuscript evidence. Then it's provable through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not just a biblical narrative. History proves the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hundreds of people witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ, saw him after his death and his burial and his resurrection. And there is more evidence on that than you would ever imagine. Not just in Christian evidences, but in historic records. And then lastly, and fifthly, and these aren't the only five, these are just five, but major, major, major evidence of the Bible is its prophetic content. 28% of the Bible is prophecy. No other religion, no other sacred writing has any prophecy. And those that do have some pointing to prophecy have all been disproven and inaccurate and have failed and fallen flat on their face. Your Bible is 28% prophetic content and they have been 100% accurate through the years, they continue to unfold before our very eyes. And I am going to conclude tonight by showing you the single super sign of Bible prophecy that has been fulfilled in our lifetime. Can I hear a good amen? amen. One Bible scholar wrote, keep your eyes on Zion. That's Israel. God's holy land. As the Jew goes... So goes the world. The Jews are God's yardstick, God's outline, God's blueprint for what he is up to in the rest of the world. Israel is the only country in the world that still has its same name, is located in the same land, and speaks the same language that it did 3,000 years ago. No other land can make claim to that. Israel has the lowest geographic point on earth. The Dead Sea is about 1,300 feet below sea level and lies at the southern end of the Jordan Valley. And its water, by the way, is 8.6 times saltier than any body of water on the face of the earth. You can't drown in the Dead Sea. You float like a cork. It's a tourist attraction. People go down there and think there's healing qualities, and there are some. The Mount of Olives in Israel is the oldest continually used cemetery in all of the world. The first computer from IBM was designed by Jews in Israel. The first cell phone was invented in Israel. Voicemail technology was invented in Israel. The USB memory sticks we use were invented in Israel. The most famous location app, Waze, was invented by Jews in Israel. The Iron Dome, many of you have heard of that. It's a mobile air defense system that stops short and long-range missiles and a list of military weaponry and technology that is unmatched by any nation, including our own, was invented in Israel, not yesterday, but a long time ago. Every day, over a thousand bombs and rockets on average are fired by Israel's enemies into their nation and the Iron Dome protects them like the wings of Almighty God. The same could be said of medicines, medical technology. Most of you have heard of bear medicines and bear aspirin. One of the giants in the medical world historically, he was Jewish. Most major high-tech companies, Google, Apple, Intel, Microsoft, all have significant presences in Israel. But I want to close by showing you three things in the Bible that every single student of Scripture must know. And I hope you're taking notes on this. The average person has less than a 23% retention rate. Intelligent people only retain about 23% of what they hear. Your pencil has a 100% retention rate. Your iPad has a 100% retention rate. And I think I just heard my wife in my right ear say, slow down. I'll do my best. Number one, Israel is the most important land in Bible prophecy in the world. You'd listen to a lot of false prophets on social media. You would think America is the most important nation in the world. 
You'd think God is sitting in heaven waiting to see who we vote in to be president. You would think God is twiddling his thumbs in heaven and frantically wondering whether it's going to be a Democrat or Republican. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but America is suspiciously absent from Bible prophecy. There are 15 specific nations mentioned in Bible prophecy. America is not one of them. I don't know exactly what will happen to America because the Bible is silent on it, but there are three biblical principles that give possibilities as to what will happen to America. But one thing I can tell you for an absolute is after the rapture of the church and the dust of the trauma and the chaos of the rapture settles on this globe, America is not present. She certainly is no longer Israel's best friend because after the dust settles, after the rapture, the Bible is very clear that Israel's best friend is the Antichrist. That one world leader puppeted by Satan arises out of the dust of world chaos and becomes the first politician in history to sign a successful treaty with Israel seven years in duration, and America's not present at the table. Listen to a message I've preached entitled, What Will Happen to America in the Last Days? There's only three biblical possibilities for that. So Israel is the most important land in the Bible, and Bible prophecy, and the world. Did you know that Israel is the absolute geographic center of the world? Do you think that's accidental? That of all of the land masses on the face of the earth, Israel happens to be the geographic center of the world, strategically located at the hub of three continents. Listen to what Ezekiel the prophet said in the Old Testament in the fifth chapter, in the fifth verse. This is what the sovereign Lord says. This is an illustration of what will happen to Jerusalem. I placed her at the center of all nations. And most people have no idea as to how small Israel is. This diminutive land called Israel is only 8,630 square miles. Or for an American, it's smaller than New Jersey. There's only three U.S. states that are smaller than Israel. Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Delaware. That's how small it is. Israel, as a nation, could fit into Alaska 77 times. The population of Israel currently is about 8.7 million, growing at somewhat of an accelerated pace with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. 6.5 million of those are Jews. One eight point million of those are Arabs. And other nationalities are less than 4%. Did you know that God made an everlasting covenant with Abraham and his descendants and gave them this land called Israel? Open with me to Genesis chapter 15 and verse 18. Genesis 15 and 18. So the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day and said, I have given this land to your descendants all the way from the border of Egypt to the great Euphrates River. In this passage, God made an everlasting covenant, an irrevocable contract with Abraham, and he said this contract is irrevocable, eternal, and unconditional throughout the Bible. In Genesis 17 and 19, a few pages later, God tells Abraham, Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall name him Isaac, and I will maintain my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring to come. Number two, Jerusalem is the most important city in Bible prophecy in the world. Number one, Israel is the most important nation in Bible prophecy in the world. Number two, Jerusalem is the most important city in Bible prophecy in the world. The most important city in the world is not Washington, D.C. It's not London, it's not Paris, it's not Rome, it's not Beijing, it's not Moscow, but Jerusalem. 
and God declared that Jerusalem would be the capital of Israel over 3,000 years ago and said, once I declare it to be the capital, it will be the capital forever and no one can change that. Many have tried. Now, if you know your history, you know that the Jews were driven from the land of Israel. Two very specific and unique dispersions. Number one happened in AD 70. The second happened in AD 135. And the Jews were driven to the ends of the earth. And as you study history, many nations, many empires, many rulers, many dictators, many warlords lived in that land, occupied that land, and have. Did you know that not one single one ever made Jerusalem capital? They couldn't because God 3,000 years ago gave that city to Israel and said it is irrevocable and unconditional. And then Israel comes back into the land. And Jerusalem just recently by our former president along with allied nations Israel has always known, but the allied nations of the world gave permission to Israel to declare Jerusalem as the capital. Let me tell you something. God made that statement over 3,000 years ago. Historically, Jerusalem became the capital of Israel by the decree of King David, and it has remained Israel's capital ever since. The Bible mentions Jerusalem over 800 times. Are you listening? Number two, Jerusalem is the most important city in Bible prophecy and the world. And in Isaiah chapter 2, listen to what the prophet Isaiah said. Because the Bible prophesied that Jerusalem will be the capital city not only of Israel, but the entire world after the second coming of Jesus Christ. The Bible said that in God's eternal kingdom, that he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth where everyone is right with God. That's why I'm not worried about the new green deal because I already read about a Bible deal. God said, I'm going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Man wasn't big enough to create it and man's not big enough to destroy it. It is under the auspices of the almighty God of heaven who has made a conditional promise with Israel. No, an unconditional promise forever and forever. Oh, listen to Isaiah chapter 2 verses 2 through 4. On the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house, that's Jerusalem, will be the highest of all the most important place on earth. So Tiff is not saying that Jerusalem is the most important city in Bible prophecy in the whole world. God did. Isaiah did. Jerusalem will be the highest of all, the most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills and people from all over the world will stream there to worship. People from many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of Jacob's God. There he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. For the Lord's teaching will go out from Zion. His word will go out from Jerusalem. The Lord will meditate between, mediate between nations and will settle international disputes. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer fight against nation nor train for war anymore. After the second coming of Jesus Christ, Jesus sets up his throne in Jerusalem and will rule and reign there forever and forever. And Jerusalem, after the second coming of Christ, becomes not only the capital of Israel, it will become the capital of all the earth. Lastly, and I close with this, the regathering of the Jewish people to Israel is the super sign of Bible prophecy. The regathering of the Jewish people to Israel is the most important prophecy in the Bible, hands down. 
Number one, Israel is the most important nation in Bible prophecy and the world. Number two, Jerusalem is the most important city in Bible prophecy and the world. Number three, the regathering of the Jewish people to Israel is the most important prophecy in the Bible. Oftentimes called the most significant prophecy or the super sign of all Bible prophecy. Time will not allow me to give you an exhaustive study on this because it's found in many of the prophets of the Old Testament. It's found in Jeremiah 30. It's found in Ezekiel 34. It's found in Ezekiel 37. It's found in Zechariah 10 and several other passages. But let me read one. Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah oftentimes called the weeping prophet. Verse 3. For the time is coming when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. I will bring them home to this land that I gave to their ancestors, and they will possess it again. I, the Lord, have spoken. Two incredibly momentous things must happen in final Bible prophecy before end time prophecies can be fulfilled. Don't miss this. Let me say that one more time because that's a weighty, weighty statement. Two momentous things must happen before end time prophecies can be fulfilled. Again, don't have time to teach on it. When you get an opportunity on the YouTube and podcast channel, listen to a teaching entitled, What is the Difference Between the Last Days and the End Times? Because I can't tell you how many times I hear that used in pulpits synonymously, but they're not the same. The last days is different than the end times. Before I run down that trail, let me close. First, Israel must be a nation. Two momentous things in the Bible, in prophecy, must be fulfilled before end time prophecies can be fulfilled. Number one, first, Israel must be a nation. Well, May 14th, 1948, Israel was reborn as a nation. And by the way, our former president aggressively, along with allied nations, making Jerusalem recognized in the world as capital. Do you remember what the date happened to be when that was official? May 14th, 2018, 70 years to the day. Next time somebody says, ah, no prophecies have ever taken place in my lifetime, it's just because you're not listening to the right prophecy teacher. Secondly, the Jewish people must return to Israel. As I've already covered, and I have studies on that, I hope at time you'll go and, and search it out. It, it's it's f fascinating to me. I, I don't understand how people can be Christians and never look at Bible prophecy or never find a trusted Bible prophecy voice. When I was a kid, my father used to bring, uh, there were two in particular, but my father every year brought evangelists into the church who were Bible prophecy preachers and teachers. And as a kid, it fascinated me. It gave me a faith as a child to know that the Bible was not hocus pocus. It was not a religious fairy tale. It was separated from all other world religions by its prophetic content. And so they were dispersed in AD 70 by Titus in the Roman Empire and then in AD 135. And there they remained until... May 14, 1948. In Ezekiel chapter 37, be sure to include this in your notes, verses 1 through 14, that classic passage in the Old Testament declaring the vision of the valley of dry bones is a prophecy of Israel's restoration. And the reason why it is the valley of dry bones, when you read it, do it in your devotions, the dry bones are restored in stages, which was a prophecy that Israel will be restored in stages. Some trace the beginning of this return to 1871, when just a small group of Jews at risk of death felt called by Yahweh in prayer to return to Israel. By 1881, it grew to about 25,000 Jewish people that had settled there. 
By 1914, about 80,000 people had gathered there. By 1939, there were 450,000 gathered there. After World War II and the atrocities of Hitler's Holocaust brought attention worldwide to the plight of the Jews, it began to accelerate. And on May 14, 1948, the Israeli Declaration of Independence is made in Tel Aviv and a few hours just before the British mandate expires. And at midnight, the British mandate of Palestine is officially terminated and the state of Israel is officially recognized. And do you know who the very first nation was minutes after that declaration? openly declared Israel as a nation, the United States of America. And historically, we have always been their greatest friend and greatest ally. One of the reasons why this nation is going to hell in a handbasket is because we now have politicians that have greater allegiances to Muslim oil than to the nation of Israel. And the Bible said, I'll bless those that bless them and I'll curse those that curse them. And just for the record, don't get all uptight, I hate politics. People always ask me, are you a Democrat or Republican? I am a born again Christian and this is my book of allegiance. My allegiance to God is greater than any allegiance. I love the red, white, and blue. If they took 63 year old ugly men, I'd fight for this nation all day long. But I am here to tell you, I have no hope in the White House. My hope is in the Holy House and Jesus Christ and his eternal word. The sooner you figure out that both Republicans and Democrats are just two heads on the same snake, the better off you'll be. Because one of the things you'll learn as you follow me in Bible prophecy is in the last days, all politicians are led by Satan towards a stage being set for the arrival of a one world leader and a one world global order. By 2009, and mark this down because it is a significant date, by 2009, there were 5.4 million Jews in Israel. 5.2 million Jews in America. Why is that a significant date? Because for the first time since the dispersion of AD 70 and AD 135, for the first time, 2009, there are more Jews in Israel than any place in the world. And so the literal fulfillment of Zechariah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel was fulfilled in 2009. Now, there are approximately 6.9 million Jews in Israel. And this is why Ukraine is so important, because Ukraine was one of the highest population of Jews in what we might call the Russian Empire. And Vladimir Putin's aggression, many of you remember the news where the airports in Ukraine were just shoulder to shoulder, thousands upon thousands of people trying to get out. Those were Jews fleeing for Israel. I close with this. To those who know end time Bible prophecy, this irrefutable, historic regathering of the Jewish people to their ancient homeland is the fulfillment of what is called the super sign of Bible prophecy. I had a Jewish man just recently receive Christ as his Messiah just weeks ago in one of our Lost Lamb outreaches. I had the privilege of talking to him and going through some personal discipleship with him and helping him. But he said, you know what really spoke to my heart the most? When you told me that God would supernaturally draw Jews back to Israel. I have a trip in eight days planned. I'm getting ready to close on a $47 million home in Tel Aviv. I have felt desperately in my heart. I can't shake it. I need to move back to Israel. And it's happening with Jewish people all over the world. It is the super sign of all Bible prophecy and do you know what Bible prophecy says follows next? The rapture of the church. And the revelation to Israel as to who the true Messiah is.
Live every day ready to meet the Lord because Bible prophecy is being fulfilled in your lifetime. I leave you with one other that I hope you'll never forget. When Israel is reborn as a nation, the Bible said the generation that witnesses it will not pass until all of these things are fulfilled. Your kids are not the final generation. Your kids, biblically and prophetically, are subsequent generations. The last generation, biblically and theologically, was all of you who were alive in 1948. And I'm not going to ask you to stand because some of you at that age can't. <laughs> or it's painful. <laughs> But I oftentimes do in our crusades for the sake of the young people, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren. Because if I asked everybody who was alive in 1948 to stand, and the young people looked around and recognized that's the last generation before all of these things are fulfilled, it would be another reminder to you that we need to live every day ready to meet the Lord. Listen carefully. The rapture is a signless event. It is the next major prophetic event. If you have an opportunity, I get this question all the time, probably by the thousands. What is the order of prophetic events? Listen to a teaching entitled, What's Next? The Chronology of Final Bible Prophetic Events. There's 14 of them. And I teach them in order, back them up with Scripture, for many, it's referred to as the premillennial view. There are some that disagree, have other views, but I believe the solid weight of biblical scholarship rests upon the fact that the next major prophetic event is the rapture of the church, and it's signless. The Bible says, in a day and an hour in which you think not, suddenly it shall come upon them like a thief in the night, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot. None of the populace in the days of Noah nor the days of Lot believed anything could happen. The Bible said they assumed it was business as usual when the judgment of God fell. And so it will be in America. The day that the rapture takes place in this nation, sadly, it'll be business as usual. And when that event happens, you will either be taken or you'll be left behind based upon one decision. What's that decision? That's why I ask you the most important question at the beginning of this message. Do you have a clear, distinct memory of a time in your life when you've knelt in the presence of a holy God and personally and publicly repented of sin and made Christ Lord of your life? And this preacher loves you. I want to help you. I've dedicated my entire life to helping people make peace with God. I believe in the soon return of the Lord. I tell people, I, I believe the rapture of the church is so close, I quit buying green bananas. Could happen tonight. How many want to be ready to meet the Lord? If you believe and receive the word of the Lord, give Jesus Christ a mighty hand of praise. Stand to your feet with me, please. I never preach without giving people an opportunity to pray. And some of you that will pray with me, it will be the very first time you've ever personally and publicly prayed what many people call a sinner's prayer. But listen, by coming to this altar, you're literally telling God, just like a husband and wife on their wedding day, how many of you know that's an important day when you get married? You make a vow before God, before family, before friends, till death do us part. When you come to an altar to pray this prayer, you're making a vow to God. You're saying, God, I want to serve you. I want to live ready. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I want to be able to, listen, I want to be able to lay my head to the pillow tonight. And know that if the Lord were to come, I'm ready to go. Think about that. What if we were to go home tonight and we would all lay our heads to the pillow and fall asleep and somewhere in the middle of the night, 
you were awakened by the sound of a trumpet unlike any you had ever heard before. Would you awake with fear or would you awake with hope, knowing that you were ready? If in your heart your thought was, I think I would be scared to death. That's not what some of you thought, but I edited my comments. Others of you would awake and realize being a Christian wasn't easy, but it was worth it. I'm ready. I'm ready. Not because we deserve it, but because there was a day when you came to God in faith and said, God, I know I've failed you. I know I've done a lot of stuff wrong. I've broken commandments. I've done stuff that I knew better. I did it anyway. But the Bible says, all who call upon your name shall be saved. That's why I picked for my last song, for possibly the last time I preach in Alaska, coming home. I've wandered far away from God, but Lord, I'm coming home. By coming to this altar and praying with me, you're saying, I'm coming home. I want to be ready. I want to be a real Christian. Whether you're doing it for the first time or you're away from the Lord and you need to come home, they're going to lead in a song of invitation. And as the team leads in a song of invitation, one more time I'm going to kneel by this sacred desk. And I'm going to pray for you that God will give you the courage to make the most important decision in your life. You will never regret the day you make peace with God. You will never regret the day you trust God and His mercy. And I don't care what your past is. God's grace is greater than your mistakes, your sins, your wrongs, your, your criminal list. He not only forgives it, he'll forget it. But you have to come by faith. I'm not going to keep you. I'm not going to embarrass you. We're going to pray together. Christian, one more time, I need you to be very sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And if you have someone near you, someone you've invited, friends, family, neighbors, co-workers, but if there's someone sitting beside you or near you and you're not sure if they've ever prayed this personal and public prayer, not forcibly or arrogantly, but in the kindness of Christ, turn to them and say, I'll walk with you. And then I'm going to ask you to just come, whether you kneel or stand, that's up to you. But we're going to pray together. And as you feel that tug of the Holy Spirit, you come now and then we'll pray in this last service. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are Sing it one more time. To the altar, Come on, the Jesus is calling. Arms are open Jesus is calling. Come on. Was with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We're going to pray with you tonight, those that are here. For every man that's here. I'd like to have some men, the altar workers, come for every lady, the altar workers, men with men, women with women. Those of you that are watching online, both live and then perhaps in the days ahead, or listening to our podcast channel or some other platform, if you're listening to this, take this as an invitation from God to get your attention. And when we pray here, I want you to pray as well. If you're anywhere in Alaska, I want you to go to KC Alaska here in Wasilla and connect with the church and they'll connect with you. If you're anywhere else in the world, I want you to go to our website, lostlamb.org, one word, lostlamb.org, and click on New Beginnings and follow the simple prompts. And I'll follow up on you personally. Please do that because this prayer is not the end of what God's going to do with your life. It's just the beginning and you need to follow through. Let's pray together and talk to the Lord. 
You're talking to him, not just praying a prayer with a preacher, a priest, or a rabbi. God's ears are open to the cries of all who call upon his name. By faith, say, Heavenly Father, tonight as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. Down deep in my heart, I want to be a real Christian. I choose to live ready in these last days. I confess my sin. And I'm willing to repent, to turn my back on sin, and turn my heart to Jesus. I trust in the cross and in the blood that you shed. Cleanse my mind, my body, and my spirit, and make me holy in your eyes. By your great grace, I receive salvation as the gift of God, and I vow this night, I will serve the Lord. I need you to help me. I cannot do it in my own strength. So in place of my weakness, fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me the power to be what you want me to be. Help me to live in such a way that all my family, all my loved ones who follow in my example will find Christ. In Jesus' name, tonight I'm saved. I am no longer the property of sin. I am tonight a child of God, and I'll never be the same. I am saved. I am delivered. I am set free. I am healed. I am blessed, and I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen and amen. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. If you prayed to receive Christ, won't you let us know? We'd love to help you grow in the things of God. Text us at 907-357-2065. You can see the number on your screen and text SAVED and we'll help you grow in the things of God. God bless you and remember, God's on the throne and the devil's been defeated. Peace.